The spirit of the one who loves us and who washed away our sins speaks these words to Francis George, a faithful son of the church, a true Chicago native, a missionary religious, a gifted man, a generous bishop who served his people well. Because you have loved me and been faithful, I will be faithful to you. I promise you the fullness of life and love as my sons and daughters for all eternity. I will satisfy your deepest desires. Each one of us here tonight hears this hopeful message in our grief, in our loss, in our sadness, and in our pain. The risen Christ speaks to our hearts. His word has saving power. It gives us joy and it gives us hope. We know that every human life begins with an encounter, that every human life begins with an invitation to intimacy. Francis heard this voice early on and opened the door of his being to a relationship that would direct the trajectory of his life. He was welcomed into his first community by his loving parents, his family, and later he was baptized into Christ at St. Paschal's Church where he was educated in St. Paschal School by the Franciscan Sisters of Joliet and the priest of the parish. They formed him in the faith together with his family. He has told us, and we may remember, how as a child he encountered Christ in his first communion and how early on he felt the call to the priesthood. As his childhood wish later unfolded, he was challenged by polio and the doubts of others. Even then, he pursued his ardent desire to become a priest with a strong will. He pursued this dream with the missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate and began a life of discipleship by living a missionary charism in the church by living with the purpose of evangelizing the poor. As a missionary oblate, he would later be well formed for future service in the church. His encounter with Christ shaped his vocational choice in life. This, many of us remember, the time when we decided to give our lives to Christ, to enter the religious life or to live the, our Christian calling as consecrated virgins or enter the priesthood or the diaconate or when we fell in love with the love of our life and decided to marry or when we heard the call to ecclesial lay ministry no other option is as important as our vocation. It directs how we love and are loved and how we fulfill the purpose that God has given us. Francis encountered God in Christ and developed a personal prayerful relationship with him as the source for his energy and his mission. Early on after we met, I remember listening to him preach. Sometimes people do pay attention to, to, to homilies. And I realized that he often returned to two basic themes. And what were these themes? 
the need for conversion and surrender to God. So basic to a life of Christian discipleship. Each one of us encounters God in the everydayness of our life, in our commitments. We are led on a path that takes us ahead to sacrificial love, what Pope Francis has called recently an exodus, a continual going out from ourselves over time. Marriage, family life, church ministry, the service of leadership, religious community, the service to God's people, and care for persons who are vulnerable and poor requires that we do this, calls us to do this at all times and in all places. We all belong to a missionary church and experience this movement so common to every Christian vocation. Francis heard the voice of Christ, the Good Shepherd. He lived out his call as an oblate of Mary Immaculate in service to his congregation. He went from the Bayou country of Louisiana to a Jesuit university to teach in, in higher education, to the service to his brothers as in community leadership. Later, he became bishop and cardinal priest. He knew this very well. He knew this dynamic very well. The dynamic of offering ourselves to one's life in mission that is possible only when we are able to leave ourselves behind. You will recognize those of us who have read the message, Holy Father's message for Good Shepherd Sunday, that this is the very thing that he, he theme he returns to time and time again. He tells us to offer one's life in mission is only possible if we can be able to leave ourselves behind. Francis George knew this well. He worked at constant conversion within himself in order to serve his mission. As missionary disciples, we're asked to do the same thing. He surrendered to God over and over again in illness and health, in good times and bad. And don't we do the same thing in our lives, in our commitments? Easily, we may call a person, a man or woman of faith, but we know in our hearts, it's much harder to live it concretely because it means we have to go out of ourselves and constantly go beyond our comfort zone. How did Francis see his mission among us? Often he said it very simply, I want to keep you together around Christ. Do we remember that? How many times he said this in different times that he was with the people and with us. I don't think this was a naive sentiment or some pious intention. We are all well aware of the minefields we travel over and the polarizing forces at work in our church and in our society. Even the divisions in religious life and in family life that are so painful to us. As we reflect on these divisions and contradictions to our calling, we know that ecclesial communion does not happen by chance. It is the result of hard efforts, constant efforts. It is a costly, costly activity. It is not a bargain. With his keen sense of the centrality of Christ in life, Cardinal George understood our common call to holiness and to mission. He would often say, build relationships and the rest will come. I have come to understand for him and for many of us, it means trust, 
competency, and fidelity. We know it is costly love and a commitment lived out in sacrifice. Many of us here tonight knew Cardinal George, some very well and some only from afar. What was it really like to encounter Francis, to know him as a person as well as an archbishop? We can say he was a funny, generous, compassionate, intelligent, and hardworking man. A sensitive person at times who poured out his life generously for us. Who could listen and invite many different people to bring their gifts to the table. I think that many times we, have, we saw Car uh, Cardinal George go beyond his comfort zone in his experience in his ministry as bishop. At times, perhaps, we heard him be somewhat cynical, even somewhat negative about his experiences. But over time, I think many of us came to see, at least I saw him develop, a more nuanced understanding of what has happened in the past 50 years in church and society. We all know what he thought and what he taught. We often did not know what he felt, but we know he loved us and he cared about what happened to us. I remember when his, one of his first personal secretaries, Sister Anne McCahill, a Providence sister, was called home to God. And later on, when Ed Conway, his vicar general, died, he was deeply moved. He cried and cried and cried. I think he was also, as a person, well aware of his own limitations, certainly his physical limitations, and he had a certain sensitivity to others who had similar limitations. When many religious had to leave their parish or their residence, the convent or mother house they lived in for many years, he often responded. He called them personally or visited personally. He suffered intensely knowing that the harm children experienced who were sexually abused by priests and others. He felt deep pain and even depression over this wound to persons in the church. On a personal level, he had a, he had a deep influence on my life. My encounter in the early months of working with him was, was interesting, kind of unique in many ways. I don't remember the incident, but I remember this. He yelled at me, and I yelled right back. Often, it, it never happened again, and after that time, we established a relationship of mutual trust, honesty, and affection. Often, he would ask my opinion, as he would do with many of you, my opinion of church documents or correspondence or issues that were happening. It was a very humbling experience to have a man like Cardinal George ask you, ask for your opinion. You know, sometimes I thought to myself, well, what do I know, you know? Um, when I had the, um, some years ago when I was, when he first, after he first came, I was elected to national office in the Vickers Conference. And I asked his advice, I said, well, what do I do? How do I relate to the, the Congregation for Religious and secular institutes in Rome. What do I have to be aware of? And he told me something very, very practical that I think he understood. He told me not to expect to be liked or understood and just do your job. That advice helped me to help our conference to organize two dialogues with the conference, with Sickle Cell, with the uh, dicastery in the church about the condition of religious life in the United States. We shared 
our love for Christ, of course, as many of us do in the church. We shared our love for the consecrated life in its many forms and an appreciation of the many other gifts in the church. He taught me that the, he taught me what ecclesial lay movements were and how, how important they were to the church. In these recent complicated times for women religious, he was always available to listen to women, to encourage, and yes, sometimes even to challenge or to disagree. He also had a real concern for the plight of immigrants and encouraged our response as church. Many of us have heard of priests for immigrants, sisters and brothers for immigrants, the immigrant peer education process. A lot of this has been, came, came out of his years of experience and leadership here. Specifically in our Office of Religious, he directed us, and he directed me specifically, to pay attention to accompany the men and women religious who have come to serve our immigrant communities in Chicago. On a national level, he responded to the request of a group of women, of Hispanic women religious, to meet and address their needs in this country. And for the past seven years, he supported the development of the Association of Hispanic Women Religious in the United States. And he supported my accompaniment and presence to this group. For this, I am deeply grateful because I learned so much that my way, my culture, my thoughts, my approach was not the only way. I could learn so much from others. I remember the meeting that we had at a retreat center outside of Chicago where these women spoke truth to power to both him and Bishop Gustavo about their challenges and about their needs and about their contributions to the American church. I think he, he was comfortable with that. It was not always a comfortable discussion. But this is what I think he did. He spoke truth to power at the Vatican, with his brother Bishop's conference, and even in the political arena. Certainly, there are many ways that we approach our reality, from our vocational experience, from our culture, and certainly, as missionary disciples, we have such a rich variety of, of approaches. His approach, I think, was very, very rich, very missionary, and yet very locally rooted in the needs of this church. Cardinal George had a, had a heart for the poor, for persons who are poor. I didn't hear him boast very often, but he boasted about Catholic Charities and what a gift Catholic Charities is to the city of Chicago. He was concerned about mission service in underserved communities, healthcare, education, social services. An adventure we shared, and believe me, there are people here tonight who can contest to this adventure, was the reopening of Our Ladies of the Angels as a mission of the Archdiocese, as an alternative presence of church in a violent, economically challenged area of our city. He risked this. He was determined to see this happen. and. We depended all on the creative help of the spirit, the action of religious, the foundation of a new community, civic resources and lay volunteers. Even in the last months of his life, he visited this community and for Bible study and fraternal sharing. We know Cardinal George was available to many people aware of their human struggles, their families, co-workers, friends, relatives from home parish, as well as his brother priests and other friends from near and far. 
He was always grateful for what anyone did for him and for the church and pushed himself to be present to us, to other people. Occasionally, just from human, lack of human energy, and especially in these recent years, he was not always focused in his presence to us. He could appear tired and he even, even just out of sorts. He would recognize this. Just last year at the celebration of consecrated life, he knew he was not focused in his remarks with us. We had the adventure, some of us remember, snowed, poor parking, microphones didn't work, all of that. He realized, but he was feeling the effects of chemo, and he was not, he, he was not himself. He knew it, and he was humbled by it. And he just said, at a certain point he said to me, I'm going over to church to, to reflect before liturgy, to prepare myself better for the homily. Humble, simple, and real. He could accept personal feedback because he was aware of the impact of his person on the gospel message to the people God had given him to love and serve. He knew how to welcome many gifts to this church, and so he welcomed the foundation of, of new religious communities, fostered the accompaniment of 10 women who were cons publicly consecrated to a life of virginity in the church. He has broadened our understanding of church vocations, including the consecrated members of lay movements, and raising the standards for ecclesial lay ministry, such an important part of this of ministry of the local church. We could go on. Each of us has many stories to tell, many memories of how, how we experienced his life, his mission, his generosity. But I think that we, with enough, we have enough examples to know that there are so many lessons to be learned as we reflect on how God worked in his life. Our Holy Father tells us in his recent reflection for the for Good Shepherd Sunday that Jesus' missionary journey ends with his death and resurrection, that our vocation is always a work of God. God leads each of us, as it led Francis, far beyond where we started. We are loved and freed from our slavery to self by this work of grace and challenged by our, our resistance to break with old ways is challenged. All of us are called to a life of joy and loving communion with Christ and solidarity as with each other as sisters and brothers. We pray with Pope Francis that we may be generous in following our call, that we may allow God to help us to walk together, to leave ourselves and our false securities behind and continue together, as Pope Francis indicates to us, on the path that leads to Jesus Christ, the origin and destiny of our life and happiness rooted in the Father's heart. We open our hearts to, as missionary disciples to encounter our brothers and sisters after the, loving, the example of the loving service of Francis George.